So, um, what I'm going to be talking about is a development in uh, UK law, um, and it's a very specific development, but one with very wide ramifications, which is a move to police civility, uh, not antisocial behaviour, not offensive behaviour, but civility in public space. And that raises, I think, some interesting ethical questions. I was hoping that if I say the word ethical, um, often enough people will believe that this is appropriate venue for the talk, um, that, uh, that I think are, are, are genuinely challenging. Um, not least, what is public space? What do we mean by public? Uh, to which publics is that space uh, available and accessible? Um, and what are the ethical, I've used that word again, uh, and legal and moral consequences of setting up a series of legal instruments by which to restrict people's access to movement within and activities within, within public space, um, particularly uh, those whom we deem uncivil, and I'll be saying a little bit more about who gets to determine what civility is or is not, um, and why that might be problematic. So. Um, here's the law bit and then we'll move swiftly on. Um, they, some of you in the room may have heard of something called the Antisocial Behaviour Order, which was a notorious British civil uh, criminal hybrid order um, which was targeted at antisocial behaviour. It, um, it was imposed in civil proceedings with a, a, a civil standard of proof balance of probabilities but the breach of which was a criminal offence attracting a potential penalty of up to five years imprisonment. Um, and the uh, ASBO, as it was commonly known, um, the Antisocial Behaviour Order, was widely reviled, and in 2014 it was repealed and replaced with this raft of orders that you see uh, before you. And I'll mention some of them in the course of the talk, but actually I'm going to focus in on um, the one which is uh, sneakily highlighted in yellow, the public spaces, uh, protection order because in a way I think it's uh, in, a, in a long list of uh, iniquitous orders and I'm happy to say something about the rest of them um, I think it's the most problematic and the most um, troubling um, what it is just to uh, give you the, the, the headline and then I'll go into a little more detail is an executive order that can be imposed by a single individual, the contents of which can say anything uh, that that uh, it, uh, official uh, more or less chooses. And the strictures um, upon their range of choices are very light, and I'll, I'll say more about that um, anon. Um, so the focus here is on the order which by some measure has proven to be the most controversial and has attracted most consternation and concern amongst all sorts of civil society groups. Um, and um, it's really problematic on many levels, legally, I think morally, ethically, um, again, um, because what it does is determine incivilities. It, 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 it provides the facility for, we call them local authorities, you may call it city hall, I don't know, would that be an appropriate term? Um, to, it gives them with the, the facility to designate um, large areas of our cities as uh, subject to these orders and to determine what may or may not be done within those areas. So the obvious question is why does public space need protecting um, in the first place? And the kinds of questions that I'm going to um, go on to address in order to answer that question is, well, what is public space and what's private space and uh, is the relationship between those two uh, changing? I'll suggest that it is. Who has a right to enjoy public space? Um, and who are the public that these orders are seeking to protect? And is it the public in the conventional sense of um, all of us, or is there a narrower public in mind uh, who are deemed worthy of that protection? Um, and if so, who stands at the margins and who's excluded? Um, and, and one of the kind of key issues here is, uh, arises from changes in the usage of and, and, and ownership of, of public space. Um, this is a picture of four uh, locales chosen more or less at random from city centres um, around the United Kingdom. Um, they are variously, let's see if I can remember, um, they are variously King's Cross, um, Edinburgh. Um, one of them, I think, is um, uh, Glasgow and another one is Croydon in South London. Um, they're areas which are um, a new genre, if you like, of public space, which is in fact not, despite all the uh, appearances to the contrary, is not public at all, it's privately owned. 
Um, so the criminologists or sociologists of urban space in the room will be familiar with the idea of mass private property um, charted by people like Clifford Shearing in, in South Africa, Philip Stenning uh, and so on. Um, the idea that there has been a proliferation of shopping malls, of leisure facilities, of university campuses indeed, um, which are privately owned but take over such significant areas of, of public life that they become what Clifford Turing called mass private property. And those raised all sorts of concerns because of the ways in which they were policed, um, not least uh, because they were principally policed by private security guards. The one virtue, if they had any of those uh, areas of mass private, private property, was that they were pretty clear. They had delineated boundaries, and they generally had a security guard standing somewhere ne near the entrance, the, 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 the theme park, the leisure facility, whatever. Um, the, the very striking significance, I think, of these new developments, these POPs, as they're called, privately owned public spaces, um, is that they look for all the world like ordinary public space, except they're not. Um, and it's become a little game, actually, that I play when I visit any city now in the UK is to try and work out, buy some little clues as to you know, which are the pops and which are real public space. Um, they don't announce themselves in any way other than a certain uniformity of uh, street architecture, a striking absence of, uh, of, of litter, um, a, a, a striking absence, actually, of diversity, um, and um, some other features. Well, you can, you can have a look for yourselves, and maybe I'll test you later on whether you spotted uh, what else is missing from these spaces. Um, at one level, they're really rather charming. Um, at another level, and if you're in them for any length of time, they have a, a certain kind of pristine quality which is actually slightly unnerving. Um, at least I find them to be so. Okay. Um, why do these matter? Well, they matter in the same way that uh, the previously existing mass private property mattered. Namely, that the reason why the developers take over these lands and develop them um, is principally for profit. And so that's one of the explanations for why they look so, uh, so very pristine. They're developed and maintained, not in the interest of the public at large, but that public which is uh, sufficiently affluent um, and has sufficiently deep pockets to come into those spaces and spend money because they're about generating profits for the companies which run them and also, uh, and not least, their shareholders. Um, and so what the private security guards in these places do is uh, restrict access, police uh, behaviour, remove people who might in any manner be deemed to impinge upon the enjoyment of those public spaces by the affluent citizens and consumers and tourists whose presence, is, presence in those spaces is welcome. Um, at the expense of the unruly or the obviously indigent citizen, and they set certain expectations of conduct, sometimes even stipulations as to dress, um, so you know, no turning up in, in shorts or no turning up without a top in the case of men and, and so on. Um, and they, uh, there's a requirement of a com uh, that people conform to a certain prescribed idea of, of civility. Um, that um, provides us with some of the clue and some of the background to the public spaces uh, protection orders that I'm going to come on to talk about. But the other, um, the other background piece really is general, more general changes in the policing of public space. And I've talked about the rise of mass private property and the, and the POPs. What we've also seen alongside a very significant and well documented uh, increase in, in private security, so I mean, if we throw the figures around, the figures are always contested because how the hell do you count who is it and who is not a uh, private security guard? But, um, but suffice it to say, you know, one commonly used figure is that the private security guards outnumber the police two to one in the UK, three to one in the US, uh, five to one in South Africa. Um, to my shame, I realise I don't have figures for Canada. Sorry, should have uh, seen that coming. Um, but at the same time, there's a question about why that proliferation has occurred. And it's not just about changes in land usage. It's also about the decline in visible public policing um, and the decline also in what uh, we might call unofficial guardians. Um, the picture 
probably be completely mysterious to all of you. Everybody's looking blank. So it took British kids of a certain generation grew up on Percy the Park Keeper. Um, here's a picture of Percy. Um, Percy wasn't a police officer like any other park keeper or bus conductor or school uh, warden or whatever. Um, but P Percy had a, a kind of benign uh, and, and friendly, uh, infinitely friendly policing function. I think he's, um, he's holding a feather there and he's probably solving some small crime with the help of his furry friends. Um, obviously, that's an idealised account of the, of the role of these unofficial... Well, actually, I grew up believing all of it, so maybe that's why I'm writing this paper. Um, uh, the decline of these unofficial um, guardians. Um, and part of, part, of, so part of that has left, if you like, a kind of vacuum which has been filled by, by the provision of private security officers. Um, there's also, of course, been, a, in, certainly in the UK, a very significant um, decline in police funding such that... Um, there is ever greater reliance on what is rather benignly called the wider policing family. Uh, what the wider policing family means is the delegation of policing duties down to civilians, non-police, uh, community support officers, special constables, and so on, none of whom are in fact police officers, um, though they look like police officers, they're uniformed like police officers. Um, but increasingly also, and I think this is probably the one of the most important factors in explaining what I'm about to talk about in respect to the PSBOs, also delegation down to volunteers and, and civilian wardens. Um, and that comes along with the whole story about citizen involvement in policing, localization of control over policing, democratization, it's often said, of policing. Um, Yes, of a sort, but it, but but it's a sort which actually very quickly seeks into something that looks a good deal less uh, less appealing. So a good deal of populism, a good deal of nimbyism. Not in my backyard, thank you very much. And um, some increasing levels of social tolerance. So we begin here with a quote from the erstwhile Prime Minister of the UK, David Cameron, um, which I won't read because I'm presuming possibly you can, um, that, uh, that we should realise that, that those that we think who look, uh, they, they, that maybe you didn't have this in Canada, we had a whole scare about, around people who wore hoodies, and hoodies were apparently very threatening, and so there would be injunctions for people not to have their hoods up because that was really deemed to be scary. So um, here is Cameron um, expressing some sympathy with those people trying to navigate their way through uh, difficult urban spaces. Um, but if you just fast forward a few years, Theresa May, who we are now fortunate enough to have as our Prime Minister, um, uh, uh, was, was uh, previously the Home Secretary, Ministry for Interior, or whatever you call it here, um, who shows herself in the second quote, and again you can do the joint up reading, um, uh, to be uh, very much less tolerant. And it's this idea, this growing idea, that there is a law abiding the majority, there's a decent, uh, respectable citizenry uh, who, uh, who should stop tolerating those who are not. And I should actually, in fairness, I should say this is not a party political issue. Um, the Labour Party, when it was in power under uh, Tony Blair, led something called the Respect Agenda, which was a demand that uh, decent people were entitled to courtesy and respect, um, uh, and that should be shown to them uh, by those who presumably were not decent um, people. So Cameron's injunction that uh, we should we should hug a, a hoodie, as it became known. That, that speech was known as the hug a hoodie speech. I'm not sure you actually... I, I went through the speech. I couldn't find any references to hugging hoodies, but who knows? Uh, maybe that happened off camera. Um, uh, that, um, that kind of decline in, in tolerance and a view... Um, and, I, and maybe I'll just quote an, another bit of the same speech from Theresa May. Some people believe antisocial behaviour is just a bit of a nuisance, a fact of modern life, but I believe it's time for us to stop tolerating it. Um, those who had the misfortune to be at my lecture on Monday will know that tolerance is a, um, officially a British value. Uh, well, um, antisocial behaviour ruins neighbourhoods and can escalate. So this is a thin end of the wedge claim. Uh, can escalate into serious criminality, destroying good people's lives. Um, very little concern there about the impact of cuts to social welfare, cuts to the policing budget. 
the growth, very significant growth in income disparities, particularly after the financial crash in 2008, very little concern in the rise of homelessness or the shutting of shelters and so on. Um, and uh, a growing perception that somehow urban space is becoming more uncivil, well, big surprise. Um, so um, that stands behind uh, the public spaces protection <coughs> orders. And so now we get just a little bit more law because uh, I think it's interesting. Um, and this is a summary of a very long piece of, of legislation. It says, um, so the public spaces protection orders are set up to police, uh, restrict and exclude those activities which are deemed unreasonable, who gets to decide, a single council official, um, and have had or are likely to have had, so they need not yet have had any such effect, a detrimental effect on the quality of the life of those in, in the locality and which are or are likely to be persistent or continuing. And again, that's a purely kind of risk-based pr 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 perspective um, claim about their uh, continuation. They apply to public spaces or any place to which the public ha has a a a a access to or a section of the public. So actually, these, these public space protection orders apply. They apply to the mass private property. They apply to the POPs. They even apply to places to which you have to pay in order to get access. Um, if under the legislation those are deemed to be public. So a, a theme park, for example, or a fairground or something like that. Um, and they may both prohibit act particular specified activities or they may impose uh, positive requirements on the people who are subject to them. And there at the bottom you'll see a few examples. I, I like that one. Um, PSBO zone, no antisocial driving. It kind of implies that antisocial driving is fine everywhere else. Um, um, anyway, anyway. Um, so, what kinds of things have in practice been banned by uh, PSBOs? Well, some of them are clearly and self evidently um, antisocial, one might say. And apologies for a picture of a man urinating in public, but you know, that's an antisocial thing to do. Alcohol abuse, uh, uh, likewise, though no concern about why the person's abusing alcohol or why they seem to be sleeping um, in broad daylight on the street. Um, some of them are more problematic already, even on this slide, it's going to get worse. Um, shouting and swearing, excessive noise. Um, it, you know, who determines what noise is excessive? And these orders have been used, for example, to, um, uh, to inhibit a, a very um, common British tradition of people just getting up on little soapboxes, or I think in this case a little pair of steps, and preaching or making pol impromptu political speeches. Some of you have made me to Hyde Park in, in uh, London. Uh, Speaker's Corner is a you know, well-established tradition. Uh, these orders have been used to prohibit that kind of excessive noise. Um, and then there are some other areas of provision which seem to me solely to uh, target those who are in fact vulnerable. And it's again interesting the way this, you know, the, the, the lack of regard shown here uh, for the vulnerability of people who are um, uh, prohibited from lying down, from rough sleeping, from sleeping after dark. In some towns now it's okay to sleep during the day um, in a park, uh, but not once it gets dark. Um, gathering in groups of, of two, um, that's a, a, a local example, and I would have liked to have shown you a picture of the order. I had one on my phone and somehow managed to delete it. So the centre of Oxford, where I live, um, is subject to a, a, a public spaces protection order. I'm just going to call them PSPOs because it's quicker. Um, order, which prohibits all sorts of things one might expect, perhaps, like drinking in public. It also prohibits gathering if it, uh, two or more um, uh, young people of the age of 16 or under from gathering uh, in a public space. Sorry, yeah, 16 or over. Um, uh, so I think it's 16, 20, 21. Um, and I remember when um, I came home with a picture of this, uh, this notice on Magdalen Bridge, for those who know Oxford, and showed it to my then 16-year-old, who was outraged by the idea that suddenly she, was, she and her single friend um, were prohibited from standing on the bridge and throwing bread to the ducks or you know, queuing up for an ice cream or, or whatever. Uh, oh, there was an exception for bus stops. but you know. <laughs> um, So if you want to queue at a bus stop, that's fine. Um, but no, here, look here, I mean, prohibitions on head and face coverings, um, which um, of course is hugely uh, controversial. Mm -hmm. Prohibitions on nuisance street entertainment, um, who determines what constitutes a nuisance or not, of course, is a moot point. 
Um, I'm cheating slightly because I rather suspect these people are protesting a PSBO um, and are deliberately um, making a nuisance of themselves just to make a point. And there, quite a lot of that has gone on, um, I have to say. There's been a, a lot of people deliberately lying down and prominently in public spaces and closing their eyes and so on um, to attract the attention of the enforcing officers. And then there are some which are just downright um, confusing to me, uh, not to say um, objectionable. So prohibitions um, on skateboarding, use of remote controlled vehicles, ball games, swimming, fishing, feeding the birds, um, the grazing sheep one, I don't know why I put this one up here. Um, if you live in certain parts of Britain, you have commoners' rights, uh, just simply by virtue of living there. I live very close to an area called Port Meadow. I have a commoner's rights. Malcolm, you had those rights too when you were living there. Maybe you didn't know. To graze my sheep, uh, which sadly I lack, um, uh, on the common, as do the commoners of the Forest of Dean, um, so the, uh, the, the, the local authority for common Forest of Dean, uh, placed a prohibition on the grazing of sheep in, in public. Actually, I gave this talk in Edinburgh and somebody immediately <coughs> shot their a hand up very in a very aggrieved way and said, I come from the Forest of Dean and as the picture suggests, the sheep are really a problem. So um, maybe <laughs> I should Anyway, enough, enough sheep. Um, ethics and sheep? Uh, maybe. <laughs> Dolly the sheep. Um, Okay, um, sorry. So how have these orders been used in practice? Um, well, in the first 16 months of their existence, 130 were issued by local authorities, local city halls up and down the country. Um, they have a kind of sister order, which I mentioned at the, at the beginning, um, which was brought in by the Act. So whereas the PSBOs are applied to space, um, and, uh, and, and to anybody who moves into that space. The community protection orders are, if you like, bespoke orders that apply to individuals who have the temerity, for example, and I'm not making this up, for allowing their front yard to become overgrown with weeds, uh, to allow rubbish to collect in their yard, uh, to be heard swearing from inside the house into the street and so on. Um, and there have been 4,000 of those imposed during the same period. I'm actually beginning to wonder if the community protection notices ought to attract more notice than they have done. Um, they don't because they only apply to individuals, whereas the ones I'm talking about apply to all of us. Um, leading uh, one academic commentator to say this has been a year of law making in this country such as we've never before seen. Um, PSBOs are a blank check power which allow a single council official to ban activities in public space within a matter of days uh, after a brief consultation with the police. And, um, and so these are, by any light, uh, a, a subversion of the legislative process. They're an undermining of the criminal law. They're a kind of delegation of the criminal law down to the local level. And, um, with the result not only that we've got single officials imposing what is in effect, because breach is a criminal offence, uh, it, a kind of localised criminal law, um, but we also then end up with a very uh, problematic disparity between what's legal in different parts of the country. Um, and that relies upon you doing, which I'm almost certain nobody does, um, reading notices which are posted very, very high on lampposts, um, for the simple reason that if they're not posted very high, uh, they're ripped down within hours. Um, so, uh, I've spoken about the delegation of lawmaking uh, down. Obviously, um, one of the big problems of these orders is that they are enforced, uh, or can be enforced, not only by the police and by their community support officers, uh, but by local officials, by local wardens, by housing associations, or indeed by uh, private, private enforcement officers. And a lot of councils have contracted out the policing of these orders to private security firms. Um, and I'll say uh, one word about that in a moment. Um, they are, the, the, the content of the order, I gave you some illustrative examples. What I should have said is that there's no limit on the content of the order. It's entirely for the, uh, the, the, the local officials to determine what they think should be in the order. There are two restrictions, and they're very light touch. One, that they must consult with the local police, um, who always say yes, and they should undertake such consultation with the public as they think appropriate. 
So actually, in practice, these don't have to go through any kind of local public forum. When they do go through debate in local council chambers, they're nearly always amended and sometimes they are turned down. And that's what happened in Oxford. The students blessed them. Um, some of my students ran a very vocal campaign and got uh, quite a lot of the prohibitions. So, so Oxford um, City Council wanted to bring in a prohibition to stop rot sleeping um, and to make it a, a subject of these orders and the students said no way Jose and the council debated it and withdrew it but the, the orders don't have to go through council. Um, and the terms of the orders are extraordinarily wide so that also delegates down an enormous amount of discretion to the individual who is imposing those orders. And I just put an excerpt here which I thought was telling from again from the local guidance document. Um, which was in respect of Oxford, where drinking in public in certain areas is prohibited. But it turns out that, of course, um, they need not challenge individuals, for example, where a family are having a picnic with a bottle of wine. Um, so what does that mean? Um, that means that uh, you know, if you're sitting there on, uh, on your uh, picnic rug with a bottle of Chablis, preferably chilled and in a wine glass, that's fine. A crate of beer, uh, a group of young people, um, apparently not. Um, what happens on, on breach is that the officer imposing the order without any regard for due process, right to challenge, um, simply can impose what's called a fixed penalty notice, um, or as it's known in, in colloquially amongst my kids, teenage friends, the walk to the cash machine, uh, because you know most young people in particular are not walking around with £100 in their back pocket. So they are summarily walked to the, the nearest cash machine and invited to get out the £100. And if they refuse, and there's a period, there's a grace period in which to pay it. But if they don't pay, they're liable to prosecution, at, at which point if the prosecution for breach of the order, because they're now in breach, um, the, the, the fine is up to £1,000. Just think back a few slides, um, spitting, uh, uh, feeding the birds, skateboarding, uh, flying remote control, you know, thousand pounds, really. Um, so the big question also about proportionality. Um, well, I could go on about this for, for almost, uh, almost ever, I suppose, um, but uh, I'll keep it short because otherwise Marcus will um, shut me up. Um, so, you know, what rights do these orders uh, imperil? Well, you know, here, here's a very obvious list, freedom of expression. You know, what about the speakers at Speaker's Corner Association? What about my 17-year-old now daughter uh, who might want to hang out on a bridge in the centre of Oxford with more than one friend? Um, or even one, actually, because two is enough. Uh, protest, religion, the lady in the hijab. Uh, freedom of movement. So that a, lot of, um, a lot of local uh, authorities have criminalised uh, one might say, in effect, standing still. Uh, loitering has become a subject to order in many, many towns, um, so that the, you know, if you have the temerity to stand still, let alone lie down, um, you're already um, in trouble. And um, there is, this is, I think, really shocking, there's no accountability requirement whatsoever. So we have had, historically, in the UK, for hundreds of years, the provision of so-called bylaws. Maybe you have them too. But the bylaws have to be reported annually to sec the Secretary of State, to the central government. Um, there is no official reporting requirement in respect of these orders. And any of the data that I've given you has been as a consequence of individual lobby organisations putting in freedom of information requests. Uh, in order to determine what's going on. Um, as I've already said, there's a very limited duty to advertise ahead of the imposition. Again, the notice period is as such as the local authority deem appropriate. Um, most local authorities don't deem it necessary or appropriate even to put a notice in the local newspaper or online or whatever. They just put these little notices up very high on uh, lampposts and um, and I go around photographing them, which is a really sad admission. Um, and with insufficient prior notice, so you know, if I wasn't in this um, in this game, I probably wouldn't know that I couldn't. Uh, my daughter couldn't stand on Magdalen Bridge with her friend. Um, I do, but most people don't, and that raises all sorts of important questions about legality, rule of law, you know, right to know when you are or are not conforming to uh, the laws in your area. Um, Granted, they, um, they, they, they reduce bureaucracy, they reduce costs, but at, but at what costs? Um, 
Well, here are just a few of them, and I'd be very happy to have a longer discussion about this. You know, a lot of the, the activities that I earlier described um, speak to a whole array of underlying social problems, uh, and not least economic problems. Uh, those who are targeted principally by these orders are people who are indigent or uh, who are for reasons of poor housing or whatever, um, liable to spend a lot of their life in public space. Uh, young people also, minorities also. Um, and nothing in these orders actually tackles uh, uh, you know, the lack of provision for youth, the lack of housing, and so on. Um, well documented already in respect of other uh, ancestor orders, what these orders do, if you regulate a particular area, and particularly you know, the pop or the pri mass private property, what you do is you simply shift the antisocial behaviour out to the areas beyond the designated area. And that's already, it's not only uh, well documented, it's also actually interestingly acknowledged in some of the guidance documents, and the police are very concerned about this because they can see immediately what happens. The, 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 the homeless go and hang out just outside the zone where they won't, won't be bothered. Um, I've said enough already about delegation of power and about the erosion of criminal law and of police authority. Um, worth just saying one word about the resort to private enforcement. You probably can't, in fact, I'm not sure I can read. Um, what it says in the back of this guy's jacket is environmental compliance officer. Um, he works for a company, and there are many of these companies, which have developed in order to... Uh, to take advantage, if you like, of the uh, opportunity provided by these orders um, called 3GS. And 3GS is, I have to read this out because I always get it wrong, an ethical environmental enforcement company. And he's one of their officers. Um, and here he is on the streets of Bournemouth where he's been hired by uh, Bournemouth, or his company has been hired by Bournemouth City Council to enforce their local uh, PSPOs. Bournemouth, by the way, is a small, um, seaside town which relies heavily on tourism so I guess one could say well they have an interest in ensuring that their public spaces are welcoming to and appealing to tourists um, but um, here's the rub of this the enforcement for, of minor incivilities like for example littering has gone up 20-fold after the uh, this in ethical environmental enforcement agency were hired why so? Well, it turns out, and I did do a little uh, digging on this, it turns out Bournemouth Council is not paying them a single penny. Um, they don't need paying because <laughs> those fixed penalty notices that I talked about earlier are going straight into the pockets of the private company and they make their money and this gentleman makes his money by stopping little old ladies who drop their handkerchiefs and slapping uh, fixed penalty notices, I, I'm making that up, I've no idea if they enforce them on little old ladies. Um, they slap those orders on, on uh, people who drop litter um, and that's how they make their profits. Um, so, um, Marcus told me that I must stop after half an hour and I'm in extra time so I'll wrap up. Um, Here's a picture of Croydon in South London. Um, actually, it's not a picture of Croydon at all. It's a picture of a developer's idea, uh, ideal of Croydon. Um, uh, notice that the people are all rather uh, well-dressed. Actually, I think they're taller and thinner than in real life. I suspect I have uh, apologies for that. But maybe not. Maybe not. Um, uh, there's a very striking absence of, of, of litter. Um, they're all rather young. They're all carrying um, shopping bags or busy consuming things. Um, uh, this is what Croydon actually looks like. <laughs> um, and there's one of those notices that I spoke about, which the council unwisely put at a sufficiently low level that it was easily um, ripped apart, um, as invariably, invariably happens. And it's, um, it's that disjuncture between the kind of idealised idea of civility in public space um, and, uh, and what actually happens, which I think is most um, concerning. So, um, to conclude, oh gosh, actually one thing. So, and I've lost it, this morning's news, and maybe you have already read the news, that announcement of Sidewalk Toronto, is it called? So the yeah. development by the parent company of Google of the Lakeshore area of Toronto as a privately owned public space. Um, I'm sure you have many more in this city, but um, uh, I, I printed it out to hand around and I'll find it when, when we get to discussions. 
Um, anyway, conclusion. Um, so this is not just a British problem, and they, you know, certainly the pops happen here too, and you're just about to, to get an, a new one. Though I noticed from the BBC reporting, which is always, of course, wholly accurate, um, that this is to be an inclusive uh, public space. Um, I suggest you watch that space to see whether you think that's really true. You're now well armed. So what criticisms might we make of uh, these orders? They claim to make public spaces more welcoming to the majority of law-abiding people, um, for minorities, for the marginalized, for the homeless, for young people, um, I'm not so sure. They seek to create this kind of illusion of uh, a world without inequality, without poverty, without difference, um, to create a kind of cos what, what I like to call the cosmetics of injustice. Um, that is, they, 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 they kind of, well, I'm probably going to say something really sexist here, but you know, the women in the audience will make you know, those perfect blur creams that you know, remove all imperfections. That's what these orders are trying to do. Sorry, maybe men use them too. Um, tough luck if you have to be poor or homeless, um, or if you don't, uh, or if you have the temerity to, 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 to want a bit of busking, um, for example. And, um, and if your lifestyle or your habit or your activities or things that you like doing are deemed to be uncivil, um, then uh, you will find yourself uh, having your lives restricted. And the public space then becomes this rather anodyne, um, and I, I would even say boring place in which uh, people who conform to a prescribed idea of civility, uh, who have money in their pockets and who are bringing uh, that money to bear in local businesses, um, are welcome uh, and uh, the rest are not. Um, and so we might say um, goodbye tolerance and diversity and hello beautiful people. Um, and I just have to leave you with that, um, which um, there, was, there, was some, there was some wonderful protests against the PSPOs and um, this was my favorite, was, and I have no idea who did it, but they went to some expense because they just went around putting signs on benches um, there's a, I think I've got another one. Um, if you shut, I'll read it. If you shut your eyes for more than 10 seconds whilst on this bench, you may be deemed asleep and risk of facing an ASBO. Actually, legally, that's incorrect because the ASBOs have been abolished. So these people are well-intentioned but legally illiterate. But, uh, <laughs> um, by order of public space, it should say spaces, uh, protection orders under the anti-social base, and so on. But, um, but that was my favourite. I, I showed that to my then 19-year-old daughter, and she said, What's the problem? Um, <laughs> but um, anyway, um, I see a problem here, and I'm rather hoping you do too. Thank you.